Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio. And we're back. Hey, with hey. More. What's up? What's up, Pavi? How are you doing, Doug? Yeah, I'm good, dude. I'm keen to talk about uh, open AI and the mission for humanity's future. Uh, this is Talos Talks Shit. Welcome back, everyone. We are continuing our discussion on the leaders in the AI field. We've been focusing quite a lot on Google DeepMind last few episodes. Yep. Have a listen. Really interesting. And now we're checking out OpenAI, the direct competition, but also not. So benevolent competition. Benevolent competition. That is a that is an interesting combination of words. Um, so as I stated at the beginning of our DeepMind bit series, DeepMind's mission is to solve intelligence and then to use that to solve every other problem in the universe. That's an AI-focused mission. Their, their mission is progress. OpenAI, on the other hand, uh, was started, well, formulated by Elon Musk, primarily because of his worries surrounding the dangers of AI and the improvement in AI technology. And their mission is building safe AI. That's it. it sounds just, that's, just safe AI. Just safe AI. Just AI we don't that's not going to kill us all. And it's simple, guys. We just want safe AI. <laughs> yeah. And part of their charter, in fact, is that if a company like DeepMind manages to crack the artificial general intelligence code and uh, beats them in the race to AI, they will actually stop working on what they're working on and divert their resources to make sure that DeepMind or whatever company is following their same goal. So this is philosophically quite a different mission statement to DeepMind. It's not like uh, the space race. It's not like the space race. They're not racing to create a product. In fact, if you listen to Greg Brockman, one of their founders, they are racing to create a not a race. <laughs> They're basically trying their hardest to make it so that there isn't a race yep. to AGI so that no one cuts corners and that no interesting problems rear their head too late. Yeah. So that being said, they started not that long ago. It's like 2015. 2015, yeah. yeah. They started 2015. in 2015 and they essentially started where DeepMind finished. Their first thing that they did was they created a algorithm or an AI rather that was able to beat the reigning solo champ at 1v1 Dota. So Dota, for those who don't know, it is somewhat similar to Star StarCraft. It's a strategy game, but Instead of relying on base building and economics and units, it relies on hero classes. So okay. you select a hero with certain special capabilities. Those capabilities give you certain advantages provided you play with strategies that allow you to use that hero's capabilities to the utmost. Oh, I see. So you can't like use strategy A because it's like made for this dude. And yeah, you, actually, you like, can. Use... There are certain things like there's, there's instances where you buy items to buff or improve your character. Someone that needs like better range of movements buys fancier boots so they can move around boots. faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buy some dancing boots. Exactly. <laughs> buy some dancing boots, buy some mangoes, do all <laughs> sorts of things. But <laughs> as always with this, there was the human best strategies. So before um, open AI's AI beat the 1v1 player. And it's important that they started with the one versus one game because that is similar to the one versus one StarCraft. And that the potential outcomes of your moves are limited by the fact that there's only two players on the field. Yeah. Later on, which we're going to get into in a separate episode, they were able to beat a five-player 
system, meaning that they have to, had to have a team of five bots that were able to coordinate with each other. And that in itself is very interesting. But as, as far as sort of strategies and tactics go, just the same as with chess, Go, Shoji, all the other things that AI has beaten humans at, the strategies that the AI has used are totally unseen. They, 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 they're nothing like anything any human player would have suggested or played. So 2015, they get this very competent, pretty amazing um, AI that can beat 1v1 Dota. And um, from that, they thought, okay, we've got this, this, this AI. It's very robust, it's very adaptable, it's very flexible. In my opinion, Pubby might disagree with me on this, in my opinion, it's more flexible than DeepMind, but that's an endless debate for another day. Yeah, I don't know. From I Just the sense that I get from the two companies is that um, what OpenAI is really good at doing is taking an existing algorithm and just applying it at a huge scale with huge amounts of data. Um, so they'll be like, oh, uh, this algorithm seems to work pretty well on this problem. I wonder how much data I could actually throw at this thing. And they'll just throw as much as they can. Yeah. So and it, it works. Yeah. But like, and I think like DeepMind on the other hand, uh, they definitely, well, at least from what I think, they also use a whole bunch of compute. Like, for example, um, when they trained the Alpha League, right they used 15 tpus for like i don't know three days or something and one tpu is approximately like 50 gpus or something so there was like a whole so, so bunch of 500 yeah it was like an ungodly amount of days. compute that's that's yeah. a lot of compute yeah. sorry in fact i think it was like they used one tpu and they had 30 agents so it was like 30 times like i don't know it was some ungodly okay amount. but um yeah they I, I mean, I, I don't done in Kruger, but they definitely, I think that OpenAI is, they both are really good like AI companies, but I don't, I wouldn't know to say, oh, DeepMind is better than OpenAI or OpenAI. Well, I'm going to stick to my opinion, even if I'm wrong, <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter. I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> no, no, I love no. OpenAI. <laughs> oh, AI overloads are going to like, take over us no matter who makes him yeah no, that's that's true um but sorry we digress there they took this already robust and flexible ai and as you say it's also it's getting into a, a point in this research where we have these things that work very well yeah and they seem to work very well with lots of data but if you throw tons of data at it all of a sudden shine. they work better yeah and no one really knows why scale. yeah because there are more data isn't always better there this are things such as the overfit problem where uh, an ai will see so many results clustered in such a certain formation that it will take its line of best fit which in this context would be its thought process for making the next move yes yeah. so overfitting actually works the other way around it's, uh. if it sees say for example i only have five pictures of a of like a dog right okay. and i'm mis mixing around overfit yeah. and underfit so underfit is also a problem but it's not caused by too much data uh. but what overfitting would be is if your neural network just memorized something so overfitting is essentially memorization oh, it's hard like, memorization yeah it's like okay. inflexible memorization okay so it makes it brittle yeah um, yeah so, so in fact that's a really interesting way to think about it. thanks basi that's an interesting way to think okay. about logic systems they're just overfitting to a very particular rule right so they're becoming too expert yeah in their outlook. I never thought about it that way that's cool. okay interesting because like what open ai did next is they took their algorithm for one move one dota and they decided to put it into the real real world so all of these companies are doing all of these amazing things but when we think of agi we think of like robots walking around legs arms they can pick up things they can do things whatever 
But human motion is actually incredibly difficult. It's notoriously hard. Yeah. Yeah. We have <laughs> the fact that we stand and walk is almost like a scientific miracle. You know, there's so many different things going on just to to actuate your legs and keep you standing straight that it's very hard to replicate you'll see those boston dynamics robots they have these huge packs on their backs yeah hundreds of gyros and stabilization mechanisms and you have to model like all of it a lot of them yeah i don't know if it's all i, I don't know much about it but well i think they have to model yeah. pretty much well again randomization they yeah. don't model everything they model for the most random scenarios yeah. possible same with OpenAI. Let's call it OpenAI V1. OpenAI Dota V1. Oh, yeah. They then took this and took it to this robot hand. So this robot hand was designed to be mostly anatomically correct. Um, and the fingers actuate as normal fingers do. And the goal was to get this hand to learn how to manipulate an object in 3d space it was like a like a, a cube. cube right with like a, little alphabetic letters it was it. a cube with colored sides and letters okay so, so each like set a, a red yeah. a blue b green or exactly whatever. and that was quite important to it because what it did was is it so this hand was sort of set up in this um sphere type space and around it were all these cameras and these cameras, all they did was read RGB information and letter orientation information. And they would say, so even beyond just getting A red one side and B blue other side, yeah. they would make it flip A on the corner and make sort of non-normal shapes okay. from it, you know? And this, similarly to AlphaFold, has been a very difficult problem yeah. to tackle because if you try and simulate all possible movements and create a result from that you end up running out of compute power and you end yeah. up not being able to just to it. back up this so i uh, just to explain how it's done so you have two options right you can either like try program this hand in the real world even if you use machine learning you can like try have a real object manipulated around and then try back prop but the problem is that you have one hand and like making a robotic hand is extremely expensive right so that's not an option the next option is to simulate a hand in a computer program right and that's right. nice because you can simulate thousands and thousands and thousands of hand movements but the issue is um you have to somehow take that computer knowledge and apply it in the real world and obviously for example you can model the friction on the hand and you can model the weight of the thing but it's not the same thing as doing it in the real world yeah you'll never as far as i understand it you'll never be able to accurately model every value that it might yeah. encounter so what do they do to overcome this well so they use this idea called domain randomization right and what the idea is is that Whenever an experiment is run on a hand, um, so well, so the first is the whole concept is called sim to real, right? Yeah. So, so these guys the use simulation, simulation yeah. to the real world, yeah. and it's a pretty straightforward idea. The idea is just change a whole bunch of like not important things in your environment, and then do the same thing again. Simulate right? the same. Yeah. Thing. Same. So yeah. So like, do show me red A, but change. The friction a little bit or change the weight a little bit or change the color of the background or do a whole bunch of things that shouldn't really affect the performance of your task and the thinking is if you can perform this task across a whole wide range of scenarios which are invariant to the task you're trying to do then this thing is going to learn to do the actual important task and it's not going to overfit to some right. late thing in the environment. So it almost learns how to ignore everything except what it's, what it's trying to do. To do. And um, just to simplify that, uh, the definition OpenAI gives is they de-emphasize realism. So you're not so focused on what might really happen with Q to optimize for randomness. Yeah. To optimize for, for any possible outcome. And this seemingly simple trick 
allowed them to do something no one's been able to do before. Yeah, and it's interesting because um, there's actually a researcher that was writing about it and they were like, so this seems like a really easy idea. It seems really simple. And usually simple ideas don't get me very far. So why, why does this work? <laughs> why does it work? Yeah, yeah exactly. Especially, and it's, yeah, it's especially in this field where the things that seem to work seem to be the most mysterious, complicated. Yeah. Voodoo. This is just and like... I just changed the wall color, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now this is a major step in taking artificial intelligence and putting it into the real world. But it's still a complicated step. They still are running multiple neural networks within this AI to allow for grander understanding. It's not one agent doing everything. So for example, I know with the hand, they actually have three convolutional neural nets yeah. to create imaging data. Yeah, from like three different perspectives. From three different perspectives, and that's fed into some sort of evaluator system, yeah. which is then fed back into the, what would it be? Yeah, so I'm not actually sure. I think what it did is I sort of had sensors on the fingertips. Okay. And the idea was um, it, it has some, the concept of a reward in this case is getting the right configuration. So the actions are moving the fingertips, right? Right. And it's which are the correct sequence of actions of fingertip movements that allow the correct configuration of the cube. Right. So your reward is in the same way that like you win a game or you don't in Go, um, or you get the right protein structure or you don't in Alpha Fold. The reward over here was, is this the correct configuration after the sequence of moves being, how do I move my fingertips? Okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> as we can hear, the more we try to explain this stuff, it gets deeper and deeper and yeah. deeper. But the fact is, is that they have taken a major step in bringing AI into the real world. Yeah. And the steps they took after this get exponentially more interesting because the AI used for Dactyl was the same AI used for Dota 1v1 and then the same AI used for Dota 5v5. And they just scaled up the process. They just scaled up the process and they allowed for proximal policy optimization. Yeah, so that's one of the algorithms used to actually achieve this whole, whole thing. So, yeah, so do you want to just up. explain what PPO uh, Without trying to get very technical and complicated, what it basically is, is, um, so remember how we were talking about backprop? Mm. Um, so the issue with a whole bunch of reinforcement learning algorithms is that it's very difficult to backprop into it. Because mm, there's a ton of data. And also backprop is like a calculus idea. It's made uh, okay. for like continuous functions. Right. But um, sometimes you have parts of your system that aren't differentiable. Um, and, and by differentiable, I, oh yeah, sorry. See, I've become technical now. <laughs> um, basically, uh, you need smoothness in some sense, right? Um, but there's some parts of the system that are not smooth. They're like right. jagged. And the, what the PPO algorithm is, it's a way of getting around the jaggedness of the system. So as far as I understand it, it's a way to update sample data size at each step to avoid confusion or lack of data. So if we imagine this as a thought process traveling between neurons going deeper into the net, trying to figure out a solution and coming back out. Yeah. If it has certain data at one point, but then goes to a node where that data is less important, it's going to update itself and just do small deviations to keep its sort of data focus yeah. current. Sure, yeah. You know what I mean? The idea is don't go crazy with your yeah, updates. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. Like just update uh, your weights, but just stay a within bit. a trusted region. Exactly. Within exactly. a proximal region. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So... But that weight updating is the whole backprop calculus part. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it helps it aids this process yeah. along. And again, it's another one of these seemingly simple 
algorithmic ideas that when combined with deep neural nets and reinforcement learning and all sorts of things creates a much more intelligent system. Yeah. It's like another step towards huge data understanding and adaptability. Yeah. Um, and the fact that OpenAI was able to beat a 5v5 game of Dota yeah. is many, 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 many times more complex than a 1v1 game of StarCraft or a 1v1 game of Dota. Okay. And this is where we need to get into game theory just a little bit. You know, we, we touched on it previously, but game theory was started by John von Neumann. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, to figure out poker. Really? It was yeah. poker? Yeah, not that he was, was particularly poker. interested in poker. He just wanted to be rich. No, you just realized John von Neumann was beyond money. Um, <laughs> he just realized that there was a, a logic system involved in the way we play games. And the way we play games really in this sense is extrapolated to the way humans interact with each other. Yeah. So game theory is the probability distribution of potential outcomes for any two-player situation. Yeah, you know, that's that's very scary. I, I would say it even simpler. I would just say it's the study of how people interact with each other under situations of uncertainty. Right, okay, that works, that yeah. works. And it's both philosophical and logical because you get different types of games. You get a zero-sum game versus mm -hmm. a non-zero-sum game, for example. So a zero-sum game is like, well, someone has to lose. So yeah. Someone like Coca and I'm going to get it, or you're going to get it. But someone's going to definitively yeah. lose. Yeah. Uh, whereas a non-zero-sum game, the losses could be interpreted differently. Um, it also means that, for example, if I was trying to figure out a deal with Pubby, a business deal with Pubby, me and Pubby trying to figure out that deal is a much simpler process um, than me, Pubby, and four other people trying mm -hmm. to figure out that deal. Because with each person, you're adding different kinds of game theory. This one may be, and this is where the big problem comes in. This this guy may be in a zero-sum game, but this guy's not in a zero-sum game, you know? And That's scary. So you can't use zero-sum game logic to, to solve for the other um, agent involved. Yeah, that's intense. Yeah, so really why this is important is because Anytime an AI is going to interact with any other agent, whether it be another AI or another human, they are going to, unless we figure out any better way of turning human relationship into compute, they're going to have to game theory. They're going to have to make decisions under uncertainty. Exactly. Under uncertainty, under randomized conditions, and under imperfect data sets. Yeah. So as we followed this AI journey step by step by step, OpenAI 5, which and their GPT-2 language algorithm um, are the first real steps in multi-agent game theoretical approach to AI interacting with the world. Ooh. So, I don't know about that, Masi. You don't think so? Hey? I, don't, I don't know. I but don't know. Just because multi-agent... So, I mean, we'll, we'll get to GPT-2. But um, from what I understand, it's like a language model. Okay, maybe I was just too excitable about <laughs> GPT-2. But definitely... It is really, really AI cool. Five. It is really, really GPT cool. GPT-2 is terrifying for very yeah. important reasons. Yeah, yeah. Very important reasons we're going to get into in the next yeah. episodes. But really what I was trying to say was that... The fact that it can manage a five-player team yeah. in Dota yeah. is... Oh, I see what you're saying. You know, that each each bot within that team is an individual agent, and yeah. they have a multi-agent goal to defeat the other yeah. team. And um, that way of making machines sort of understand game theory, should I do this, should I do that, understanding Nash, 
equilibrium or Nash yeah. distribution. Uh, equilibrium. Nash equilibriums, uh, which are line, well, not lines, data points of best fit for multiple agent scenarios. Yeah, it's so, basically just the best you can do in any given situation. The most likely outcome yeah. to be good for you. Yeah, it's with like the strategy that, that you can do such that if everyone played the optimal strategies, this is what everyone would do. Right. So it's like rock, paper, scissors. So the Nash equilibrium in rock, paper, scissors is everyone plays a random strategy. strategy. Because if you do anything else, someone can take advantage of you. Okay. Okay. So that, may, that actually makes perfect sense. So these agents are figuring out strategies and communicating with each other in a loose term and um, evaluating and taking steps forward. And this, just before we go, this was only done in April this year. What, GBT2? Uh, OpenAI 5 beating. Oh, was this? Yeah, that was April this year. So that is the sort of freshest of the fresh of the newest kids yeah. on the block. And uh, to find out how a OpenAI 5 was trained and how it beat a team of five humans, and then how it learned to write articles about unicorns. Fake news. Fake news, bro. You are fake news, GPT-2. <laughs> fake news. Um, Imagine like a fake Donald Trump. Well, the fakening. Right? Deep fakes, dude. Oh, yeah. Yeah, never mind. I take that back. Yeah, we'll we'll get to deep fakes. We'll this is get why we can't have nice things. We can never have nice things anymore, <laughs> dude. Um, except you can have another episode of this podcast. So please catch us next week for more deep dives into AI. Thank you, Pubby. Thanks, Mas. Keep me straight. Thank you, Blended Audio and Blended Podcasts for providing this opportunity for us. And thank you, Mr. Mafiana and Selected Hearing for the smooth, smooth beats. Cheers, everyone.